Hello, everyone. Welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, which is part of a research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. We are very happy to have amongst us today, Dr. Shewki Sabur, who's currently an associate professor of anthropology in the Department of Economics and Social Sciences at Brack University in Dhaka, Bangladesh. She holds a PhD in sociology from the National University of Singapore and MA in Cultural Dynamics from Hiroshima University in Japan. She's currently working on her upcoming book, Marriage and Friendship, Social Networks of the Bangladeshi Affluent Middle Class. We are also extremely delighted to have Professor Dina Siddiqui as our chair today. Professor Siddiqui is a clinical associate professor at New York University. Her research and publications cover a range of issues grounded in the study of gender and Islam in Bangladesh, such as transnational feminist politics, women's work in the ready-made garment industry, the anthropology of human rights, gender justice, and non-state dispute resolution mechanisms. She's the author of Women in Question, Gender and Labor in Bangladeshi uh, Factories and Human Rights in Bangladesh. So about the format of the session today, uh, Dr. Sabur will be speaking to us for about 45 minutes, after which there'll be a discussion between Professor Siddiqui and Shilpi Sabur for about 15 to 20 minutes, after which we'll open it up for audience questions. Uh, while the talk is going on or during the discussion, if you would like to put in your questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box to do so, and I will be taking them in order. So without much further ado, I now invite Dr. Shilpi Sabur to speak to us today on the formation of the middle class in Bangladesh. Over to you, Shilpi. Thank you, Priyanka. I'm honored to be here and uh, credit goes to Priyanka and British Library um, to pick my work and showcase it. Um, today, uh, I'll be talking about formation of the metropolitan middle class um, and in Bangladesh. Um, in 2017, uh, World Economic Forum marked Bangladesh uh, as a potential uh, Asian Tiger. Both Asian Development Bank uh, and World Bank report have spoken of a possibility of Bangladesh becoming upper middle class in income country in 2021, which is this year. Similar hopes and desires are expressed uh, by uh, Bangladesh Institute of <clears throat> Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies, and uh, they actually projected growth of um, middle class in the last 10 years uh, between 9% to 20%. The newfound interest in middle class has rarely, however, resulted in a critical analysis of unsta this unstable category. <clears throat> Macroeconomic research uh, almost always presented this class as a homogeneous question about uh, its composition and uh, practices and aspiration um, are hardly ever raised. While the political implication of such questions are never acknowledged, let alone debated, my research attempt to make the section of this class tangible and um, address some of the concerns that I have raised here. And as an ethnography, it is a contribution to empirical and theoretical knowledge of middle class in and from global south. The research is an outcome of longitudinal study among middle class conducted over um, uh, four phases since 2005. Um, I've been working both in Bangladesh and in London. I have um, inter interviewed 438 people um, across 80 households. Uh, and 11 family um, uh, that have worked with very intensively, uh, working with their genealogies, biographies, uh, and, uh, and both located in Bangladesh and in London. I revisited the families in 2018 using family as a unit of analysis helped me to locate transition and transmission of accumulation of capital from one generation to the next. Uh, what do I mean by Bangladesh? <clears throat> Bangladeshi middle class. Uh, I suggest that it's a layered, complex, and diverse class, a group of individuals with tertiary level of education, engaged in specific profession, um, sharing a set of core values. These individuals have accumulated different forms of capital, economic, cultural, and social over the generations, enabling them to maintain a particular lifestyle. While I have often used the term metropolitan middle class to refer to affluent section of the middle class living in metropolis. I have also found that 
this affluent metropolitan middle class has been morphing into transnational class. Now, today, I'm not going to talk about marriage or, or the friendship that constitute this class and, and uh, expand their network. Rather, I will talk about the origin story. The history of middle class <clears throat> reveals stories of aspirations, accumulation, and their effect on domestic ideology across various colonial and post-colonial social formation. This is also a narrative of oppression and post-colonial state formation in which marginal mu Muslim in colonial India navigated their way through the political field. Claiming their share of power and eventually become one of the major protagonists in creation of Pakistan and later Bangladesh. Finally, this narrative put gender at the center of the class and uh, state formation, the form and the nature of this occupants are ever changing, so is their social world. This ch chapter <clears throat> that I'm presenting from my book um, is the first chapter uh, uh, I'm publicly presenting, so I hope you will understand and uh, give me the useful feedback. Uh, this particular chapter actually uh, takes the plunge into the lives of people who have embodied the his story of oppression and sheer resilience uh, for generations. Uh, the colonial state formation um, actually facilitated the class formation, and I would like to um, put our, our map uh, in front so that it's e easier to see the um, uh, cartography and the changes um, in, in that formation. The transition from feudal to wage economy in Bengal in 19th and early 20th century instigated the formation of middle class as well as the accompanying social transformation, including in the household structure and domestic ideologies. All of this started with British colonial state reconfiguring the economic judicial administrative system of Bengal, producing system where bureaucratic producing assistance that were bureaucratic in nature and capitalist in ideology. So the first map is actually, um, it, it's, it's done in 1865. So it, it <clears throat> looked at um, the earlier, um, it is one of the earlier uh, map of um, Hindustan um, and it, it map of British India. Um, so the time I'm talking about is, is pre-partition, uh, so early um, 20th century, late 19th century and early 20th century, where the middle class started its journey. The late 19th and early 20th century marked the emergence of an interlocking system of colonial rail waterway in Eastern Bengal. Um, and what it does is connecting the major trade port with a region supplying labor. So the Imperial Commerce of India, tea, jute, coal, could thrive. This massive infrastructure required intricate system of management and regulation to extort every bit of surplus and channel them into the imperial capital system, capitalist system. Under the British Raj, the government became the major employer facilitating specialized branches like engineering, medicine, education, postal service, railway, police and judiciary. With the introduction of a wage economy, then the state become the key facilitator of middle class formation in Bengal. English education become a site of class conflict when the colonial administration changed the language of judiciary from Persian to English, leaving hundreds of Muslims service holders jobless. The vacant positions were soon filled up by the English educated Hindu uh, belonging to Bhadrullah class. Now I have a long and detailed discussion on Bhattalo class and, and uh, the rise of Jodhar, which if I have time later, we can talk about the transition, um, the decline of uh, uh, Zamindari and, and rise of Jodhar and how it, it contributed the kind of class formation that we see now. Uh, despite this, it took the Muslim aristocrat and affluent Jodhar and trader until uh, end of 19th century to embrace English education and participate in the colonial elite social and political realm. The overall growth of East Bengal, the involvement of Muslim in trade, uh, increase in production of price, and the price of jute and paddy contributed to the prosperity of Muslim Jodhars. Um, uh, slowly but surely, children of affluent Jodhars and traders 
attained secondary tertiary education, entered the job market, there was only a steady growth of number of Muslims in Mufassil um, or urban center exploring future education and occupational possibility. The British Raj for its part had been cognizant of emerging Muslim leadership um, since 1871 and wanted them to organize um, the community as a separate entity. Special concession in education, employment, and even in representation to different bodies were offered to them to deter them from entering into Hindu-dominated politics, encouraging them to participate in local government bodies between 1800, uh, 1883 to 1882 to 83. Um, predictably, the kind of affirmative action did not please the Hindu leadership. The ultimate blow, however, came from Lord Person, who decided to march uh, north and east Bengal with Assam in uh, 1905. So this is the map in, of 1907, which actually uh, shows the, the how Bengal looked like, undivided, <coughs> uh, the divided Bengal looked like. Um, so the new emerging Muslim middle class and aristocrat headed by Nawab Salimullah supported this um, partition wholeheartedly, clearly seeing uh, its potential opportunity for growth in business and administration, uh, which up to then had been dominated by Hindus. Now, the impact of the new electoral uh, created in, <clears throat> um, so what happens is that um, the British government would eventually give up Hindu elite demands and reunite Bengal in 2011. Um, but what it does as a concession is that um, it, it, it actually facilitated the political representation in le legislative um, uh, councils. And so there's a se separate electorate that has been announced where um, we see the enormous uh, response from the, uh, from the Muslim, um, especially Mufassal Muslim um, who, who actually um, took part in, in these elections. The impact of the new electorate created by 1932 communal, uh, create, the impact of the new electorate created and um, 1932 communal award followed by the Government of India Act in 1935 was favorable for Muslim middle class. Um, A.K. Fazlul Haq wins the first premier of, uh, wins first premier as, of Bengal as the head of Fusha Praja Party and Muslim League Coalition Ministry in 1937. Um, this, and what it does is that it, it, it brings the hope to Muslims life. And what happens is that, um, he proposes Bengal Tenancy Amendment Bill in 1937, 50% of quota for Muslim in uh, police recruitment, 60% of government appointment and um, in 38 and reforming the Secondary Education Board um, in 1940 with greater participation of Muslims uh, with a step that one or the other resulted in gradually dismantling Hindu dominance. It's not only that, what we see uh, is that um, the work towards this not only work towards the emancipation of Muslims, but also imagine a new nation where Muslims would have autonomy as full citizen and dis decide their own fate. In Lahore Resolution, March 1940, Muslim League formally proposed a separate state for Muslim. In 1946, the Muslim League had gained mass support among the Indian Muslims and owned the majority of Muslim constituencies. Hussein uh, Shahid Sarabi uh, becomes the chief minister. Uh, fuel the fire of Potterlock anguish uh, against the Muslim. And uh, we know the rest of the history that how um, the communal riot uh, was instigated um, since then and um, how the transfer of power um, took place in 1946 and 47 um, on 14th and 15th of in 1947, um, Pakistan in India was born. Meanwhile, the series of communal riots shook the subcontinent, lines were drawn and new nation state territories were demarcated. The new year of freedom was heavy with mourning. Um, what happens after partition is basically, so this, this, is, the, this is what it looked like during the forties. And this is the colossal movement that we see after partition. And there are, and, and this, this 
what happens is that the spirit of nationalism that turned neighbors into violent enemies Every nationalist movement hold that possibility. Partition was well-funded as it was economically beneficial um, for both Hindus, uh, business community, as well as Potolog dom dominated Congress. Similarly, it made economic sense to uh, Muslim elite and, um, and Nawa families of Taka. So Muslim nation state made good profit out of this nation as well. Partition set in motion the violent displacement of 20 million Muslims and Hindus from their home, uh, who even as they crossed the new borders to the desired nation were simply abandoned to fend themselves, often leaving life in te terrible vulnerabilities. This colossal shift was very classed in nature. Partition was only advantageous for the elite and affluent middle class who had accumulated enough cultural, social, and economic capital for resettlement. Government officials, um, government officials were given the option to move to their desired nation after encouraging, uh, after encountering communal violence. Muslim employee opted for Pakistan either voluntarily or by threat or persuasion. The civil service was predominantly filled with the, these migrants. So the migrants, incoming migrants actually uh, filled up the civil services. Uh, <clears throat> and many of them settled in Dhaka, which happened to be the administrative headquarter of capital of East Pakistan. Many of these government officials were later provided with the opportunity to buy abandoned property or government plots in Dhaka at a minimal price. There was also exchange of properties between East and West Bengal. In spite of catastrophe initiated by partition, post-colonial nation formation was pro provided unprecedented opportunities for ed educated Muslims, facilitated the formation of metropolitan middle class in East Pakistan, later in Bangladesh. Um, so Pakistan aspired to be a modern, and rapidly inter in industrialized nation state, but it could not disentangle itself from the colonial bureaucracy. The unstable political forces failed to institutionalize democratic government. Instead, enabling the civil military bureaucracy to rise, the Muslim League failed to contain the fervor of um, Muslim nationalists um, unleashed by partition and make use of it and build a democratic Pakistan. Instead, they were predictably dictated by the elites, despite trying to contain contradictory force like conservative right and <clears throat> progressive emergent middle class within the same party. This experiment didn't hold too long. The absence of entrepreneurial class in East Pakistan <clears throat> and uh, the veteran non-Bengali trading families like Adamji, Ispahani, Bawani, and other took charge of major industries, business, and commerces. Many of them had successful business in West Bengal, Mumbai, Burma, and other part of um, undivided India, and many had the Muslim League endorsement. The state invited them to set up new banks, industries, provided them with the land subsidized loan and other privileges. Um, one of the, one of the uh, statistics says that um, the non-Bengali business controlled 28 tea garden, 93% of large import and trading sector, 70% of the deposit in East Pakistan were in non-Bengali banks. During this year, um, 1951 to 54, 12 jute mills, paper mills were set up by Pakistan Industrial uh, Development Corporation in collaboration with non-Bengali business houses. At the same time, number of salaried officers increased exponentially in West Wing compared to the East Wing of Pakistan. The aspiration for democratic Pakistan soon began to disappear. For the Bengali Muslim middle class, uh, in the face of growing internal colonialism, giving away the antipathy towards the Pakistani state that would eventually lead to the struggle of independence. Um, students were the first one to voice uh, the, against this uh, voice discontentment against this ruling classes, were first one to organize themselves, resist Pakistan internal colonialism. The East Pakistani army brought uh, left and center slated together, protested against the failure of the state uh, recognized 
Bangla as a state language also initiated movement for provincial autonomy. The state violence and murder of student involved um, with language movement in 1952 became the blatant projection of yet another colonial forces. So um, this is, and, and the thing is like, if you look at the faces of, of um, of course, intentionally I have put all the women in the photo, but uh, the faces of movement from 1952, uh, 1969, all the major political uh, formation um, actually led by the middle class, even though there was a mass uprising um, that has been, uh, but, but the leadership was given by the middle class and, uh, and affluent middle class. Uh, while Amli, what we see is that there's a there's a there's a tension between 1952 onward. Uh, there's a massive uprising in 1969. Uh, finally, uh, it throws um, overthrows Ayub Khan and replaces Gen General Yahya Khan. Um, and the military bureaucratic alliances continue to support the new regime. Yahya Khan allowed political activities to resume and in uh, 1970 announced the first general election um, to be held in that year. And Amalik emerged with the landslide victory winning 160 seats of 1962 seats. So of course, this was not very comfortable for, for the Yahya government. While Amalik for, forwarded the draft proposal of regional autonomy to Yahya in um, 23rd March later had already opted for military solution. The Pakistani army cracked down on civilians in on 25th March 1971 and Bengalis fought valiantly. Uh, after nine months of bloody war, the millions of dead along the way Bangladesh secured its independence in on 16th uh, December 1971. It is worth mentioning here that the military bureaucratic alliances facilitated the internal colonialism while there was mass uprising led by the middle class on both sides. The strategies were drawn by elite and the middle classes, whether in East Pakistan or West Pakistan. The emergence of Bangladesh as a nation state played a crucial role in reorganizing the class relationship um, of this region, rebuilding the political and a physical um, infrastructure from, from the wreckage of war. Biggest challenge for the um, state was to actually salvage the nation um, uh, from, from this wreck. The first five-year plan was uh, constitutionally obliged to di dismantle the capitalist system, income distribution, and private ownership of means of production, and of um, actually mercantile or feudal forms of production. There was a, like a lot of big words. Um, the enlarged en public sector required e economists, engineers, doctors, professionals, and other technocrats. And the new planning commission brought together uh, technocrats and bureaucrats to run the state machineries along with uh, political leaders. Once again, state became the crucial facilitator in consolidating the power of new middle class, who along with elites largely benefited from the na nationalizing um, the major industries, banks, insurance agents, agencies between uh, 1972 to 75. It was the bureaucracy dominated by the middle class that emerged dominant in vacuum created um, among the elite. With the petty bourgeois able to overwhelmingly monopolize the state apparatus, this particular group not only fashioned the new nat nationalist discourse, but also emerged as a hegemonic class, uh, both ideologically and politically. Um, what we see is the chaos and multiple crises, um, immediate post-war um, era culminated in foundation of one party, uh, one party uh, government um, uh, led by Sheikh Mujib and uh, completely nullifying any vestige of parliamentary democracy. A military coup, a coup was staged to overthrow Mujib government in 1975. Uh, Sheikh Mujib and his family were assassinated by the army officers. This marked the end of era of uh, mass nationalization. Two successive autocratic regime followed in 1970 Five and ninety, the first um, general Zia's re regime came to power and mandated um, 
the rep rapid denationalization and economic and trade liberalization, facilitating the rise of new entrepreneurial class with vested interest. The Cold War politics also played a major role in tectonic shift in occurring in countries' internal and the US government had long-term interest in private capitalist inv investment and formed a natural alliance against the communist bloc. With the newly emerged Bangladesh becoming crucible for these experiments, the neoliberal turn transformed the character of the state while creating space for middle class to realign itself, which continued even after um, uh, throughout the autocratic regime. Around this time, NGO started to mushroom in order to manage the inflow of aid. Um, neoliberal state became manager of transnational capital flow, uh, composed of aid and investment. The sector required an army of development professionals, thus become a major source of employment for the middle class. The second autocratic regime led by uh, Hossein Mohammad Ershad came into power. And we see um, there are me mega project, but a stagnant uh, stagnance in economy. Um, the subsequent democratic government led by Begum Khalid Zia uh, and Sheikh Hasina also assumed leadership to renew um, a surge of investment by multinational companies and boom in the ready-made garments, leather tech, telecommunication, IT and other industries. This expanding private sector uh, further ensured the job for the both working and middle classes and enabled the formation of new elites consisting of increasing large number of entrepreneurs. So um, this class formation is fundamentally gendered in process. The transformation in the gender role that have occurred in modern Bengal have its root in colonial past. The shift not only provided the material condition for middle class formation, but also facilitated the transformation of domestic ideologies. The birth of capitalist waste economy realigned gender roles and transformed how family and kinship relationships should be perceived. The domestic ideology produced in colonial colonies appeared as a translation of Victorian English bourgeois ideology that marked the capitalist society with distinct sexual division of labor and separation of um, sphere, public, the realm of rationality and production, private as a realm of morality and consumption. Uh, and the thing is, um, what we see here is that, um, and, and in, in many cases, the uh, subaltern studies work and, and um, post-colonial studies work, we see that um, many actually translated into, into, into uh, modular politics and say that they emulated this, um, uh, this ethos um, unquestionably and internalized this ethos and, and claiming privileges increasingly stereotyped as a effeminate babu as opposed to the masculine English man also led to the emergence of new women who uh, was expected to, more, to be modern. Uh, yet modest. I argue that even though colonialism may have provided the material condition for the class formation, as well as the um, demand for professional and administrative officers to run the state machineries, in reality, all the colonial rulers wanted was sophisticated loyalists enslaved by the similar ideologies. A project unquestionably may be embraced by the upper class Hindu, the late arrival of the Muslim in participating in colonial modernist project and their inherent resilience against both caste Hindu Brahmo Babus and their colonial master helped them to fashion their own distinctive domestic ideology. The romantic portrayal of home as the ideal sanctuary uh, consisting of the man as a master of the house and women as a children as consumer could never be materialized in the context of Bengali uh, Muslim middle class. Rather, men and women played complementary role in the domestic realm. This is neither to suggest the absence of hierarchy nor women were advantageous position. What, what it means instead is the marriage as an institution um, would be potentially facilitated equal partnership because part of the reason it, marriage in, in among Muslim uh, Muslims were were a contract as opposed to um, sacrament, which is which is for uh, for Hindus. Muslim women does never really aspire to be ideal Victorian passive docile women, nor could they fashion um, 
fathom claiming ownership over their husband alone. Both men and women were still treated part of the collective in colonial uh, Muslim Jodhar feudal families. Thus, when men began to move to the Mufassal, doesn't matter whether it during the colonial period or afterwards, uh, it, their young wives tend to stay back uh, in their own um, in their own or um, husband's ancestral home. There, there they would be groomed by the matriarchs of the family and only to send uh, to live with their husbands when they are come of age uh, and were capable of running their own household. Sometimes young a younger sibling or domestic worker would accompany them so that they would not feel lonely in the new place. Newly married couple might build their nest in the town, but they were never alone nor separated um, from their ex extended kinship network. Most men and women are tried to uh, try tied to their ancestral home by the entitlements of to the property as well as their obligation to extended kin. Even recently, um, as the later were entitled to ask for the favor often seeking temporary refuge in their home to continue their higher education, search for employment or match for the marriage. Under these circumstances, women were fully occupied in managing their household and working to ensure the sustenance of their own children as well as the extended family. At the same time, men of the household were expected to take care of immediate families as well as their extended family members. In early uh, 20th century, there were hardly any affluent urban middle um, class family. This is what I wanted to show in the previous year. Is that it's not immediate family and it's it's not the nuclearization that 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 is uh, bestowed on on to middle class it, that had that never happened uh, because urban Muslim household uh, without extended family members li living with that was unfathomable. This shattered the image of docility that has been bestowed on Sharif Bhadro or respectable women, and indeed that, that the men as a master of their house. The nuclearization of the family monogamous companion, <clears throat> mar companionate marriage, however, relieved uh, men and women um, from mundane role of feudal joint family structure and asserted new kind of autonomy within the family. Assistance of house help and extended family members freed up the time for both men and women to work on themselves and forge new social relationship in town. Both men and women not only reached out to uh, to the members of their extended families in town, but also joined the clubs and association to familiarize themselves with the locals. Men may bring the money home, but women work towards rooting the family in town through simple act as reaching out to the neighbors, holding families and office gatherings, generally keeping their social network alive. Women were productive member of the family who had to manage household with limited single income while maneuvering an intricate network of kins and regulating various forms of capital accumulation, ultimately ensuring the Product, reproduction of the middle class, as I discussed in, in my other chapters. Handful of this educated uh, Muslim middle class women joined the workforce during 1940s and 50s. Muslim women not only started uh, joining the workforce, but many of them had, uh, had been also keen uh, taking part in anti-imperial resistance, independent movement, um, independence movement, as well as class and caste-based movements for decades. The anti-imperial nationalist movement had multiple ideological influences within which highly influential was left political parties who were more welcoming towards the women. Uh, for the subcontinent in 1940s was the era for um, Second World War, famine and independence movement. Um, women organization actually responded to this crisis, uh, women and, and organized themselves and responded to the crisis. Uh, similar case happened in 1971. The gendered image of nation corresponded with the colonial middle class domestic ideologies where men represented as the public icon as, as the maker of history and protector of the nation while later was, was in turn um, iconized as a women mother figure waited to be rescued. This narrative uh, um, idealized women um, as sub <clears throat> subservience, denying their active role in rebuilding the nation state after partition or 
all the mobilizations that led up to liberation war. Partition essentially ravaged the economic and social capital and everything they held dear, yet they persisted. The post-partition influx of elite um, and middle-class Muslim migrants from India found natural allies among the local elite in Dhaka, forming a critical mass and continuing to work towards the social reform. Some of these educated Muslim uh, middle-class migrants initiated neighbor association. Women's magazine like Begum, Joyshri, Sultana Be <clears throat> became their mouthpiece. They eventually become the platform um, to voice discontent, protest against the polygamy, dowry, inequality um, in property rights. These brave women responded to every national crisis and carved their um, place in the history. Muslim women were at the forefront of shielding Hindu families from the uh, violence of communal riot instigated by the uh, proclamation of Hindus <clears throat> Sorry, proclamation of Urdu as the state language in 1948, the Muslim Women League played a crucial role in unifying women during the language movement in 1952, uh, with women leading the procession and demonstration, uh, which I showed, yes. Procession and demonstration um, joining other forces in protecting minorities in the aftermath of riots and ethnic cleansing that engulfed uh, East Pakistan in 1964. Women Association held public demonstration during the Indo Pak War in 1965. The police attack on the procession of female students in um, 9 January 1969 was also followed by a spontaneous outburst of women re um, revolting against the Ayub regime without any political instigation. Women made themselves an inevitable part of the nationalist movement by claiming the public space, which paved the way for the women movement and a post-independent Bangladesh. Many of these educated middle-class women served in the field hospital, fought the war and supported the freedom fighters and helped with the rehabilitation of women who survived the war. Post-independent Bangladesh was a land of revolutionary possibilities and uh, outburst of feminist energy was channeled uh, towards building the nation of equals. Um, as my interlocutor Aisha Khanum would say, we envisioned a new woman who would be independent economically, socially and fight against all forms of oppression. Even though this dream was not fully uh, materialized, um, but secondary and tertiary education become an integral part of the Muslim middle class identity. Within two decades of independence, increasing number of professional women found their niche in the class structure. At the same time, the impossibility of middle class household to maintain the cosmopolitan life they aspire to on a single income has meant that women are now increasingly required to become financially independent. This idiom of women's empowerment in neoliberal economy is equated with the greater purchasing power. The, this does not mean that women have been released from their traditional roles as housewives or custodian of family accumulation, nor does it mean that family or the state have created an enabling environment where women can engage in both private and public lives with equal ease. Instead, women now have them have to now have to um, create the condition within which the family would allow them to work outside while performing the balancing act of maintaining integrated kinship network and other socially assigned roles. The transformation in class and gender role took a very sharp turn, which has been infused into mid middle class value system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shyoti, for your paper. Um, I'm sure the audience will have a lot of questions to ask you, but before we turn to them, I would uh, like to invite Professor Dina Siddiqui to have a conversation uh, with Shyoti. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you. Thank you, Shyoti. Um, let me I just... hope I was on in time. I finished on time. It, I think you did. I think you were perfect. In time. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. You were in time. Yeah, yeah. You were totally on time. Thank you so much. Okay. Wow. That's a lot, Shirti. Um, hopes and desires. I will hold on to that. Middle class hopes and desires and who is the face of the nation are two things I wrote down. Let me begin actually by congratulating you 
not just for your wonderful presentation, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but because, because of the broader framing of your intellectual project, which takes on, seems to me, orthodoxies of various kinds, which is only to be expected from you, should be, right? I think you're really charting new territory. And let me just say, I had the honor of reading a longer version of what should be presented. So much of what I'll say will be on that. First, and I think it's very important, you move us away from the tired tropes through which Bangladesh is conventionally studied. It used to be in the old days, poverty and overpopulation. Now it's women's empowerment of a new liberal kind or it's religious extremism or it's uh, climate change or it's all together, all of those things. This means that the policy and the academic gaze tends to be on the so-called poor, right? We either need to be saved, they need to be upgraded, they need to be civilized. So the result of that, one of the many outcomes of that is that we have very few studies of the middle classes in what is now Bangladesh, as you pointed out. So in fact, I was looking through stuff to compare with, you know, as I was preparing today, and there's really not very little, very much. Although as we were saying, everybody, you know, before we started, everybody has an opinion on the middle classes, but there is very little analytical stuff. This also means this sort of obsession with a certain narrow kind of development and uplift of the so-called poor is that class as an analytical and relational category has been really marginalized in studies of Bangladesh. And you're trying to bring that in, as far as I can tell, okay? And this, it's been marginalized because of a certain, you know, to use a shorthand, neoliberalization of knowledge production. We don't talk about class, we talk about women and their empowerment as though women were in a unitary category, right? And I think, and I will say this, it's very, you reminded me once more that if caste is an analytical blind spot still for many in a study of India, it's class for Bangladesh. We just don't, you know, we don't analyze it even, you know, especially in um, development stuff. And it's nice to be able to talk about papers that don't directly deal with development. Second, and I think again, reading your paper reminded me yesterday is that there is actually an enormous literature on the middle classes in Bengal. It's that Padrolok literature, it's there. And it's proliferated and proliferated, right? And in fact, the Bhadralok, the middle classes are the central actors in nationalist movements, right? They're the ones, nationalism and um, South Asian middle classes, especially the Bengali middle classes are co-constitutive in many ways as the literature shows. I was just reading a book review of somebody's book of a book by Sanjay Joshi who talks about middle classes. And the first line said, the middle class is the protagonist of modernity. Um, very interesting, but when we, this entire literature, when we're talking about the Bengali middle class and its understanding of gender, its understanding of religion, its understanding of nation, or its self-fashioning, self-definition, it's implicitly Hindu upper caste Bengali that's being spoken of in the literature and that's being reproduced therefore as a truth because it's constructing the category and reinscribing um, in the scholarship what is hegemonic perhaps in certain kinds of social practices. So the subject of history is the Hindu Bhadralok, male or female. What you are doing, and I'm going on about this because I really want to locate your project in, in a world where you know conventional historiography and anthropology reiterates rather than questions the binaries and assumptions embedded in the making and mobilization of political categories like the middle class. You're actually, I mean, you don't say all of this, at least you say it implicitly, it's there. You talk about the obsession with the Bhadra look, which I thought was rather nice, very well put. Okay, this is all changing very slowly. So it's not as though there isn't anything else. But if you look at the literature again, I was trying to prepare for your talk and I was looking at things. So 
There is a very important book by Rochuna Mojundar on marriage and modernity. It makes no pretension to talk about anything but the upper classes, but in a sense, it becomes representative of you know, arranged mar marriages and how to think about it in, I don't know what you would call it, Hindu modernity, right? That's what it ends up being. There is Mrinalini Sinha's really quite brilliant book, which you refer to, but in the end, the book cannot transcend the Bengali Muslim binary. It just doesn't do it, right? Sonia Amin has written a really, really important book, pulling together, it's a beautiful book, but it's recuperative. It recuperates the voices but it doesn't um, unsettle the larger framework, right? Mohua Sharkar is somebody who tries to do all of that. And it, I was thinking that book has just not had much traction. It hasn't had any kind of effect on historiography, feminist historiography in India. I mean, maybe in Bangladesh, it's important, but certainly in India, I don't see it being referred to or having made a difference. So in relation to Bengali histories, Muslims are either erased or spoken of as a derivative, you know, the Muslim awakening happens with a lag. What you are doing, what I think you're doing, and it may be implicit, it may be explicit, is you're refusing that epistemic binary in favor of, or dismantling it, I don't know, in favor of a much more complex relational understanding of these issues. And as you say at the very beginning, Bhadrulo class privileges and distinctions, Hindu Bhadrulo, you don't even have to say Hindu, depended on, relied upon claiming cultural superiority over a Muslim other. You say that very early on. So you've set the terms of debate. What I really liked about the paper and your came out, I hope it came out in your presentation, is that you're not then saying, I am now going to write a whole history of the Muslim middle class formation that is separate you're actually entangling things, you're folding them in. And that's so important. It's a really important epistemic kind of intervention that I think you're making. You also disrupt the standard narrative of South Asian middle-class formation. And again, it's people got in English education, they had salary jobs, but, and I think here, the work of Tariq Omar Ali is actually very important. Very important. Even though Yesterday, I looked at his index. He doesn't even have middle class in, a, in his index. But anyway, the work is important and you have drawn on it in exactly the ways that I thought you would. And I looked at it before I even read your paper. So we're basically thinking in the same way. But by focusing on these cosmopolitan townships of East Bengal, the Mufashal middle classes and their different relationship, they have a very different relationship to Indian nationalism. And you can use the new work, you are using the new work that's coming up to make what I think is a very provocative suggestion, which is, I mean, it's on page 19, I have it here about how Bengali Muslim domesticities and practices were really quite distinct rather than the, what did you call it? These docility, scattered, shattered images of docility. What you're saying is that there's a very different family structure because of Muslim laws, because of whatever else, family laws. It's something I totally implicitly recognized even with the photograph, I know exactly what you're saying. I think it's fantastic because you're also really rejecting the whole Muslim women were behind, Hindu women were at the forefront, right? You're doing all of that, it's fantastic. I want to hear more about, before I go on, I, I, I will have to stop just saying good things. <laughs> it's so, I just so, was so excited by your paper, which I read this morning um, by, you know, not, you know, um, what was I saying? Um, I want to know more about the evidence, the, the magazines and things that you have, photographs. I just showed one photograph. You showed several photographs that I thought were very interesting. One is the face of the nation, the women marching. In 47 and 71, it's that middle class woman marching. We know that. But the other picture you showed of um, photograph, you showed of this typical middle class family. I would like to know more about, I totally am with you on this. In a sense, turning the tables, Muslim women were not only not oppressed, they were actually partners with their men in very distinct ways. I'd like to know more about how you're approaching that argument. It's such a, it's such a fantastic argument, okay? Um, I, how much time have I spent? Because I have a lot more to say as, as usual, but um, 
Should I? I think you have you have five more minutes. Five okay. minutes. But do you have time to respond, Priyanka? How, what do you think? Um, yes, I, I think you can go on. But we've already um, got a few questions from the audience. So I would like to leave around fifteen minutes or so for the Absolutely. Q and A. Okay. Yes, yes, I'll take five more minutes, okay, just to ask questions about contemporary, to ask actual questions, right, about the, I, I'm, about what might be more contemporary issues, I really like that you pluralize the middle classes, it's not a singular social formation, you're saying, you show the heterogeneity of it, right, and it's a, I'm very interested as the middle class is a cultural project, which you're doing, grounded in these material conditions, and how the middle classes are intimately entangled in or the pressures on the middle classes, in particular in relation to secularism and nationalism. Okay, so my first question to you quickly is, can we think about a new versus old middle class when we are talking about contemporary Bangladesh? And I say this, um, thinking about a particular book that I just looked at, it's on Pakistan, it's called The New Pakistani Middle Class by this woman, Amara Maksud. I've just glanced at it. And she also talks in terms of the aspirations and strivings. I was th thinking, who does the new middle class? Who do the middle classes define themselves against in the moment of partition or in the moment of 71? There's a striving for a certain kind of secular modernity, right? So the women represent a secular nation, you know? But there's always a very uneasy relationship between gen religion and modernity, right? So there's a newer middle class or middle classes that are the kind that are much less hostile to not religion, but to Islam, okay? and to public piety, but they're also, their, their religious engagement is part of a new middle-class aspiration to social model, uh, mobility and modernity, right? So that's one set of questions, which, because I think the question of women comes up because the struggle, there's a middle-class struggle over women's bodies and who represents women's bodies. So I'm always a little bit um, interested in, this debate where it's okay if women, but Bengali women wear jeans because it's modern, but if they wear a burqa, we've got to be afraid, right? This is all coming from a particular idea of embrace of liberal modernity and a nostalgia for a time. Yeah, okay, anyway, so that's the first question. The second question is about the anxieties of self-representation globally and our middle classes post Eshad, post 2001, as they become much more global, are very invested in how they are seen transnationally. And I remember mm -hmm. after 2001, with these rising discourses of terrorism, um, people were really worried about their sons and daughters' access to US visas, you know, social mobility. I mean, mobility and travel have become so constitutive of middle-class identity. So anyway. The third thing, and what I'm really interested in, and I'll say this very quickly is, I don't know if you've thought about this and maybe you'll think about this in the future. I don't think you're there yet uh, because you haven't probably done the research, but how do working class identities constitute middle-class women's identities? And I've been going to a lot of talks of, on this porimoni thing and somehow the issue of slandering through invoking garment workers keeps coming up. And as you know, I work on garment workers. Ah, garment workers, their motto, there's a whole middle-class sexuality debate on garment workers that we can talk about. But anyway, I think there's a way in which middle-class sexuality is still very puritanical. And it's work the working classes who are very um, morally lax, okay? That's a lot of stuff, but thank you so much. I really enjoyed doing it this, and um, thank you, Priyanka, for inviting me to be discussant. Priyanka, should I take the questions or should I uh, start responding Dina's first and then go on to the questions? I think you can respond to Dina's questions first and then I'll read out the questions in order to you from the, from the audience. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, thank you Dinapa so much because I needed that. <laughs> it is the first stage of my work and, and it's very important to have um, have this encouragement as well as the the critical um, 
uh, interjections at this the, right at this moment. Um, there are three things that that uh, you are right, and you you saw in my paper, which which still needs a little bit of uh, fine tuning. But one of the major things that I think I am writing this book coming from this frustration of not being represented. Um, yeah. So that is that is as a as a uh, as a scholar from South Asia, that is a political project that I am in, and that has been my political project over the years. So uh, I am not here to like dilly dallying and and sweet talking and 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 joining the queue. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I, I have a political project, and project is actually establishing um, a scholarship from Bangladesh and and which represents Bangladesh, which is not come. Um, so. So that is that is the first thing that I I we both agree that 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 has to be done, um, and to do that it, it's it's not useful to say that I am doing something novel. I'm building up, building things on uh, on things that has been done before, either critically engaging or drawing from their ideas. Like um, I, I think one of the one of the great books uh, I've read recently was actually Joya, Joya Chatterjee's book, Bengal Divide, was very, very refreshing. Um, Mohua's book was very refreshing. And Tariq's book uh, was extremely refreshing because this, this is exactly what I was talking about. It, it's, uh, I am talking about metropolitan middle class, typically Dhakaite middle class, but Dhaka has become Dhaka because Mufasil emerged. Dhaka became Dhaka because certain kind of capital uh, was accumulated in Mufasal that, that made these people come to Dhaka, uh, be in the urban center, become the actor and the middle class that we are talking about. So the, the accumulation and circulation um, of capital and, 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 and constantly uh, the, the reason I'm talking about a particular middle class and it is broad, broadly framed because I can't really, it, it's, very, it's almost impossible to talk about uh, middle class without talking about the, the permanent settlement and, and the, the, the colonial formation that has happened before. Um, so I am kind of, um, how I, I, I'm dragged by that sometimes, but at the same time, what I'm trying to do here, as you see, is like actually refusing this reiteration and also, as I said, it's not anecdote because this is a story of resilience of minority. This is the story, the minority, Muslim minority, who actually uh, pushed so much that it, it not only made two, two nations, India and Pakistan, but also uh, uh, actually helped or facilitated to form a nation which suits them, which is, which is secular, religious, secular, whatever, however you put it, disentangling those, those religious boundaries and, and, and creating their own. So that is a story, that is a unique story. If you look into it, it it's a unique story because this, this is like a small actors who become like a Jodhar who's been like a slapped left, right and center, all of a sudden like earning and becoming somebody. So it, it talks about the dreams and aspiration and what, what you can be as a, as a political actor. So that is there. Um, the, the two questions that you asked, uh, whether I'm talking about old and new middle class, I am in a sort because I work with intergenerational data. So my data is, is, is intergenerational. So it's, it's a story of three to five generations. So I looked into the family histories. So essentially that family history talks about this, not only the middle class of uh, 1920s or 30s or 40s, but of our time, right? To 2021, uh, but uh, I must say that this I actually look into the transnational um, transnational expansion of middle class and the, the cosmopolitan middle class and their expansion, and that actually answer your question that it glo how globally middle class uh, re are represented. What kind of year? now uh, do I talk about the public party not that much because the I only talk about the things that um, my respondents are helping me to talk about, the narrative I'm, I'm saying, like I can engage with other things, but the thing is also it's important because uh, it's such a messy data because it's not only spanning through three colonial formations, but it is also uh, spanning uh, across Bangladesh and London. So I have different sets of 
data and, and it had to make sense uh, end of the day. So that is, that is something that I'm working on. Um, so the anxiety of representation of middle class is you love it because less in Bangladesh, but when we look into the migrants, the first generation of migrants um, who had money, um, the early, uh, early affluent middle class who, who moved there and their relationship with the new migrants, uh, yeah. Asman and Zameen, it, it's, it's yeah. like, it's, it's fall apart. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's very interesting to compare them with the British middle class because the the one the second generation third generation who lived there ha actually made the mobility so people who are going now except you are going with a scholarship and settling there and getting a job you are you are looked down upon because because you are the newcomer like anywhere else in the world right yes. so those are those tensions are seen um among my transnational middle class groups um not not i mean there is differences and, and, and the aspirations are very different um, across the generation as well. So I address that. Um, I don't actually deal with the relationship of middle class and working class because I think middle class itself needs so much of attention. And um, there's so many things that you have to undo, untangle to do your thing. The, the mess is real. And so you, I had to chart the territory in a certain fashion. So no, I don't do that. The second part, I don't do. Thank okay. you. You might find things in big, anyway, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> we can write a paper on that. We can write a paper together. Exactly. Yes. That's what we'll do. <laughs> yes. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dina and Shilti. And I think it's time to take uh, the questions. You've eight of them already. But before okay. I take the questions, I just wanted to raise two points myself. Um, yes. uh, this one, uh, just to add to the list of references, you know, great references that Dina has already mentioned, you know, the scholarship. Um, uh, I was thinking of Pippa Verdi's uh, recent article on women and the PIA airlines during Ayub mm -hmm. Khan's yes. era in yeah. Pakistan. That might, I mean, it, it probably doesn't speak directly to your, what you are studying, but could give you, uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. Uh, a certain comparative lens uh, to work with. And uh, my, I, I had a question, again, building on uh, something which Dina has already asked you about photographs. So uh, since you're working with you know, a lot of personal archives and personal collections, have you found a methodology of looking and on reading and studying photographs to kind of tell the story um, or you know, looking at, um, magazines and periodicals to build up this narrative which you're already doing. So that was my only question. But uh, you can think about it and you know we can uh, speak about no, it later, okay. but. No, I, I, I'm ready to respond. Um, sure. So uh, I look into the archives, but I, I'm, I look into the archives of women's writing uh, which is in Shawgat, in, in Begum, um, and uh, all of those, uh, Muhammadis. Um, so basically, Zanana Mahals and Mohila Mahal, and, and uh, uh, later on, Begum, uh, and Bichitra. Um, so these are the print, print uh, I've looked into, but my work heavily depends on the ethnography that I'm doing, ethnography in a sense, um, the family genealogy, because that is something I, methodologically, I want to develop. Uh, like inter intergenerational um, uh, method that, that, that I wanted to develop. Um, regarding photos, um, there are family photos. Um, uh, there, there's a huge archive of family photos, but also um, I must acknowledge there are certain trepidations in this research is that um, there are many actors who doesn't want to be revealed. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell their story, and 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 it, it and it's just such a complicated um, methodological problem. And and Joya Chatterjee and I had a discussion, and she she said you you must pseudonym them. But the thing is, when it's a prime minister, uh, like even if I pseudonym them, if it's a minister and and doing certain things, even if I pseudonym them, I can't really. Um, totally be discreet about about these things so even the photos are shared um, even the accumulation details are shared so I have this huge uh, data on different forms of accumulation so property and all of this now those things when it's coming to write about book uh, there are 
even though they signed uh, that whatever they have discussed, uh, um, it's okay to publish, but um, I'm being doubly careful about those things. So even the photograph, I except for my own family friend, family members or the immediate friends um, who like I'm in contact with who are uh, having privy to read my drafts. Uh, other than them, I'm not using the photograph that much. Um, so that is that is there. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Shyoti. I will start taking the questions now. Uh, the first one is from Nova Ahmed. Uh, thanks for the lovely talk. The secular fight for equality that started, where do you think it is now? Why couldn't we engage more men into the movements? Thank you, Nova. Uh, the men, it's, it's interesting because uh, we, but I don't want to, don't want to not answer that. I think men are also changing and shifting. Uh, their gaze is also changing among the middle classes and there's the, the changes are apparent. Um, but also I think part of the problem was that uh, women themselves uh, who organized women's movement actually saw women as victims as well. So the thing is like they were the savior uh, and they wanted to be the savior. So including men into the discussion is, is a very new development which needs time and its pace. Um, and I think uh, we all want to be savior even if we are marginal. And uh, the, the very onus of victimhood on women uh, kind of uh, evaded all the intervention from the men because it's our right, our issue, and we will be only talking about it. Um, the allyship is, is slowly and gradually developing, but also there are different forms of allyship. Mohila Purushad could never become Mohila Purushad without the help of um, mass uh, student organization in different uh, small towns and, and, and helping Mas and Kalas being helped by their sons and their um, niece and nephews. So there, there's a, even when we talk about movement, what, we often don't see that there's a class, not only class, but family also plays a huge role, how we push the causes, how we articulate them, how we narrate them, how we navigate through the political field. Um, so uh, there has been the cases, but also not um, as much as we would like to see, because I think part of the problem lies within our framing of how we want to talk about movement, how we talk about, um, yeah, that, that's, that's something. Thank you, Shyoti. Uh, your next question is from Ishrat Khan. Um, mm -hmm. I could not follow the first few minutes of the discussion. Could you please classify the new middle class in Bangladesh again? What features do you think about? Okay, um, I'll go back to my definition because that's easier. So Ishrat, um, when I talk about the middle class, I actually talk about the layered uh, complex and diverse uh, nature of the middle class um, and uh, a group of individuals with tertiary level, level of education engaged in specific professions and sharing a set of core values. Um, core values including uh, the, the, the attitude to the religion, um, forms of families and others. Uh, the individual have accumulated different forms of capital, economic, cultural, and social over three generations, enabling them to maintain particular lifestyle. While I have often used the term metropolitan middle class to refer to the affluent section of the middle class living in metropolis, I have also found that the affluent metropolitan middle class has been morphing into transnational class. So this is the, this is the definition that I'm using. Thank you, Shyoti. Uh, your next question is from David Ludden. Thanks, Shyoti, this is great. I'm struck by the dichotomy of origins between earlier rural Mufasil middle class with its jute economy and agrarian context and the later urban educated business professional middle class in Bangladesh. Does this dichotomy of origins describe the middle class in Bangladesh today? It would seem that perhaps it might be relevant for gender issues particularly if not also for the role of religion in politics. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks for listening to me because I was very scared that all the historians is gonna just kill me. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, 
it is, uh, it, it is, I wouldn't say dichotomy, rather it's one facilitating the other because, because of the jute, jute economy and the, the, the rents, the surplus. Basically, if you look into the, my original paper, it, it is talking about the material conditions of, of formation of middle class. So these were the absolute material condition that facilitated the class formation. Um, so it was uh, relevant until actually 1970s. It was, it was absolutely relevant, even to some extent till now. Um, but till 70s, uh, the, who would be the middle class and who can and cannot attain education, who can and cannot attain mobility was dictated by the surplus uh, that was that, that was accumulated rurally. So that was relevant, 60s and 70s. Um, uh, so the urban middle class, the people I'm talking uh, about now are once removed from them, uh, especially my, um, my interlocutor. Um, so most of them are like by third generation. So if I'm talking about the five, gener five generations, so by second generation, they are already become like professionals. Uh, so they, they are removed from their, uh, not removed from the land, but they're not uh, solely dependent on their land. Because I've also mentioned that there's a, a tie with the ancestral land. I am still tied with my ancestral land, whether I, I use anything from there, whether it's a trust, put in trust or not. But these are something that, uh, that we need to uh, remember what kind of accumulations actually uh, uh, facilitate a certain kind of formation of middle class. And yes, uh, as I uh, responded to Dinapa, is that there is a difference between um, first generation, second generation, and third generation, and their forms of accumulation. So. Um, Suppose uh, from my grandmother's generation, my grandmother, like she was a single woman raising four kids um, uh, with single income. Um, so after my grandfather died and part of the year came from, from what she earned, what she, her husband's pension and, and from the landed property, which is not the case for me. I, I don't get anything. I mean, anything from the landed property, even if, if I'm entitled to. So there are different kind of accumulation that is happening over the period of time and how we are managing those. Um, and the reason I'm constantly talking about women because we do not talk enough of women, how they maintain, it's, it's even if you're a housewife, how you maintain um, and, and uh, reproduce class in everyday practices and how they are, they're, I mean, I don't understand when you talk about men as, as earner, wage earner, like why, how can you not see women are making sure that he is established in a, in a city or town. Um, and, and I didn't talk about that in, uh, in here, but in my paper, I, I probably mentioned somewhere is that men could only exist in cities because women were there. These were the family men. We have to remember because when we talk about the domestic ideology, this men, the adult men are supposed to be family men and they can't exist without the family. So single men, uh, the mobility of single men uh, would be lesser than men with a family and having having wife who could actually maneuver uh, the social network uh, in certain ways. And, and, in, and it doesn't happen only one generation, but over the generation. So you may hate all the, uh, Dadinani's Golpo and and yeah, but those has economic value. You may hate uh, your mother's like reiteration of the same story, but the story of the struggle actually constitutes what you are today. So this these are for me those are the tangible forms of uh, yeah forms of class that I see in everyday practices. Thank you, Shilti. Uh, your next question is from. On Nisha Chakraborty. I have a few follow up questions to that of Ishrat. What percentage of Bangladeshi population is the middle class? Is there an economic delineation of what constitutes the middle class? Or would you say it is more a socio political cultural category? What role does caste play in defining the Bangladeshi middle class, if it at all does? Mm. Well, um, I am not a percentage person, but I also, <laughs> I, I don't do percentage that much, but I must say, um, if you look around, you will see it's the middle class all over the place. 
Cats. So whatever, be it is nationalist history, uh, be it how you define yourself, how you fashion yourself, is, is all defined by not the elite, by, but by, by the middle class. And that has been the longest period of time that has been the case. I think the whole paper revolves around that, is that how state uh facilitates certain kind of class and how they become the hegemonic class they they might be small in numbers but not in strength so number number matters i mean like but the thing is uh, it, it historically it's proven that subaltern class could not articulate um, their imagination where middle class took the lead so the thing is so yes dinapa we can talk about this that that how subaltern voices were marginalized because because we were the protagonist of making the nation and the story uh, narrative that 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 has to be uh, that one has to be aspired to one has middle class is 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 it, it's physical it's tangible at the same time it's aspirational as well right um so this this is the class who aspired people to become middle class so even if you go to a very elite household and they will say i'm so we are we are middle class because it's not the money that makes the middle class but the value the core value so that's that's why i'm repeatedly saying is it's it's not the three different forms of capital because it's not only money uh, because most of the time when you do the percentage, it is equated with the money and the status. But the thing is like, I'm not only talking about the money and status, but I'm also talking about the cultural capital and, and social capital, which is not necessarily always tangible, equitable all, all the time. Um, so yes. Thank you. Uh, your next question is from Shehzad Arifin. Could you expand on the role that marriage played, especially with respect to Muslim middle class aspirations and accumulation? Um, thank you, Shazad. You have read this paper so many times. Of course, you would have more questions. Uh, but um, I think that I, I kind of responded that question because I think um, marriage, as I said, that uh, housewifeship was only part of a job for women. Um, in, in colonial formation. So the thing is like marriage was even more, I mean, house, more than housewifeship. It was about being productive member of the family, um, how you regulate, um, surveil certain kind of accumulations. And, um, and so marriage becomes extremely important and uh, especially for the uh, social reproduction of the class. Uh, one of the cases, not in this chapter, but in other chapter, I, I talk about the death of mothers. The moment mothers die, your social network dies. And the thing is like, you actually lose your social capital. So there are cases, um, there are interesting cases where this family is like, um, like, Okay, I can't name the names, but this is this is the family who who was in the viceroy's uh, executive, last viceroy's executive. The family is, of course, like of course, extremely powerful, educated, powerful. Everyone is edu educated. The moment the the man of the house dies, the woman was not strong enough to hold the family. So hold, the family not only uh, suffered the partition half of the family stays back in India, half of the family moves to Bangladesh. And the people who lives in India, uh, the two, uh, two children, the three children, uh, two, two women and a man, the women could never get married because they didn't have the social network. And, uh, and, and the, the women who moved to Bangladesh, it, their elder sister took the mother's role and they actually automatically availed the social capital the sister had. So they were not only really married off, they had a very different life trajectories. So these are the, like, I don't know how I can make it even more uh, explicit. The marriage marriage makes or breaks, breaks middle class. Um, I mean, that is absolutely crucial. That's why women are so crucial in, um, in not only formation, but also reproduction of middle class or any class, but since I'm looking into middle class, uh, that is something that, that I'm talking about. Thanks, Shilti. Uh, your next question is from Naveen Morshi. Thank you for a great discussion. 
you talk about the affluent middle class. Who would you say constitutes a non-affluent middle class? And would you consider them to be politically uninfluential? Um, thank you, Nadine, um, again. Um, I think be because the heterogeneity, I look into affluent middle class and, and people who have three generations of, of like, three generations of accumulations of different capital, uh, people who don't have that would be, would be um, not affluent middle class or, or like um, in cases uh, or, or lacking any of those would be less affluent middle class. Um, suppose, let's put myself into the picture, right? So I am, the whatever I, I do, I still have the social safety net of my so, social network, right? The thing is a person who's also teaching at a Brack University, but parents are, are, are living in a rural area, doesn't have the safety net, right? I mean, she's equally educated. So we are both, both working in the same department, doing the same thing, earning the same amount of money, but how we uh, navigate through the social network becomes very crucial in that case. In that case, I would say if a person lacking in the social, um, like because our cultural capital and economic capital are the same as individuals, but our inherited capital is very different. And, and in that case, that person who's, who's like, if we are in the race would fall back and 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 in it would be the same case with somebody else with a higher capital than me who had like five generations of of, of, of social network uh, education uh in most cases one of the thing that education institute is the all the ivy league colleges uh, having the brand of ivy league colleges or 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 western educated versus us who are uh from uh, asia right uh, singapore Singapore, so it's like Oxbridge education, Ivy League education versus people educated in Asia. I may have a PhD, but the thing is like when you are equating the brand, those brand matters. So the thing is like, Nadine, you would, you would have better social capital than I have uh, in, in that matter. It's as simple as that. Because it's, I mean, it sounds very, it is simple, but I don't, I don't know why people don't think about it. It's so simple, it, it's so so tangible and so simple, but we often try not to see because that makes us uncomfortable. Shivti, your next question is from Shiditi Dasgupta. Uh, what are the sources of accumulation for the middle class that you identify after neoliberalism takes off? How does it differ from pre-globalization era? Thank you, Shrijiti. Um, the thing is like my work stops at um, neoliberal era because um, I think we, not stops at, but yeah, like it, the discussion kind of stops there because it, it, it starts with, um, it stops at our parents' generation. I mean, even though I talk about myself a little, I mean, our generation a little, but it tops, uh, stops there. Um, the thing is like accumulation, as I said in my earlier um, discussion is uh, like for, for many of us, like not even, I'm not talking about the millennials, but, but for our generation who, are, who were born in um, 70s and 80s, we do not have the same kind of security as our parents have, right? Uh, some of them could like avail a uh, apartment or a house um, for our generation, that is something that we have to work on and, and probably we, we can um, have those, that kind of savings uh, towards the um, end of our career, not even that, right? Um, because part of the thing is that our lifestyle has changed over the period of time and, and what we, uh, the, the, the kind of accumulations, the nature of accumulation also changed. The savings doesn't, uh, the bonds and the savings doesn't give you the same value as, as our parents could. I mean, our parents would, uh, like our grandmother could leave his, her retired life on pension. But for me, that is impossible. I can't even leave for five years after my retirement. 
So that is the that is the reality that we are talking about. Also, we spend a lot. Uh, we save less. We spend a lot. Our accumulation has changed. Uh, but I think um, in terms of social network, uh, culture, uh, and also the cultural capital, what kind of uh, investment that we do, what kind of education that we want to do for our parents' generation, uh, having education from Dhaka University would 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 suffice. But for me. Uh, it's not. Uh, even for my children, it would it, be even more difficult, like where they are getting their education, what, what kind of education they're getting. Uh, equally in, um, in, in social network that we talk about, what, because our, the, previously our parents' generation social network would entail um, their professional circle, if they're involved in politics or, or uh, suppose in lions or Rotary, those those kind of um, social network would work, and and but for us it's not the case because we are not like for many of our generations we are not involved in um, active political party or 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 th those kind of association. Like we have lots of Facebook friends, but not really tap into those social networks. Not, not necessarily. So of course the, the accumulations are changing and, and I don't talk about that much, no, but uh, there, there's a massive shift in, in accumulations as well. Thank you. I think I missed a question from Patrick before taking um, Shaduti's question and that will be the last question that I can take for this session. So apologies to Max and Rabir. Um, Question from Patrick Hume. Do you see anything about middle class formation in Bangladesh that, that are applicable to other parts of the British Empire outside of South Asia? I wish I could say yes, um, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical because as an anthropologist, um, there's this particular historical context that we, we place the class and, and the formation. So I'm not too sure, but um, class mobility, yes. You can talk about class mobility. You can talk about different forms of accumulation. You can talk about, you can relate uh, how colonial formation changed the post-colonial lives uh, of, of people. So yes, th those, those things are uh, applicable. But for rest, I wouldn't say I can copy and paste. That, that wouldn't be fair. Well, thank you so much, Shyoti and Veena, for that fascinating and enriching session. And I'm eagerly looking forward to your book now, Shyoti. So good luck with that. Um, and uh, thank you to our audience members. I know a lot of you have joined from Bangladesh. So, well, thank you for staying up so late and joining us. A recording of this session will be uploaded on YouTube, the British Library YouTube channel. And we'll be sharing it across uh, social media platforms. So do give it a, les a listen. and. Uh, share it um, uh, amongst your networks. Uh, the South Asia seminar series will take a short break and uh, will possibly be back uh, this year or early next year. So do keep an eye on the British Library What's On page for details. And uh, thank you. Thank you to all of you. And thank you again to Bina and Shilti for joining us tonight. Thank you, Priyanka, for making it happen because it, 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 was, it, was, it was a great relief to half the audience and have Dinapa on, on the panel and you as well Great, uh, yeah. talk about this. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so Thank much you. for the opportunity and British yeah. Library too.